Hello, and welcome again to our church school lesson. I'm so glad to be back with you all. And I'd like to ask that, just uh, say thank you for all of those who offered prayers during our time of bereavement of my uh, of pastor's mother. So I'm asking that will you please keep him in your prayers. But now, before we begin, let us ask God's blessing on this lesson. Dear Lord, here we are once again coming together to study your word so that we might have a better understanding of you and have an understanding of how we should live our lives as we represent you in our daily walk. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. We pray and ask a special blessing on the bereaved everywhere and those that are sick, Lord. And then, Lord, after we've done all we can do, we ask that you would receive us in your kingdom and in your son Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm back. I was a little under the weather a few days, but I'm getting back to my old self and we have another great lesson let me check in and see if we got some uh viewers with us okay i see sister uh ridgeway good to have you sister brazil good to have you glad to see you and uh but i'm gonna go ahead because i don't want to go over the time that we should uh be uh want to hold you too long for our lesson uh, hello, my friend, Patsy Kelly North. Glad to have you, darling. So let's take a look at what we'll be studying uh, on today. As you can see, we're at Lesson 10 of the Union Gospel Press. And our uh, subject of our topic for today is Blessings Amid Trials. And the time is A.D. 45, and the place is Jerusalem. And we'll be studying from James, the first chapter, verse 1 through 8, and then 12 through 18. And we'll be reading our scriptures, as it says, in the New Living Translation. Our golden text comes from uh, James 12 of that first chapter. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterwards, they will receive the crown of life God has promised to those who love him. Isn't that wonderful? And our lesson on tonight have three outlines. Praying for wisdom is our first one. That's verse 1 through 8. And our second is persevering in trials, which is 12 through 15. And our final outline is perfect gifts from above. And that is verse 16 through 18. Now, as we see, we're going to be studying out of the book of James. And like I always try to, hello, Sister Green, good to have you. Sister Ruby Baldwin, my other big sister, so good to have you all. Did I miss someone? Okay, then there's Deep, the Randall. Good to have you, Brother Randall. Um, as I did a little research to see about this book of James, there were two conflicting ideas of who wrote this. But since I'm not a scholar, I'm just going to go uh, let God guide me with this and say that this book, uh, some scholars say were, uh, it was not, it was another James. But in my research, this is James, the half-brother of Jesus, as we will see, uh, because he was writing this letter or this epistle, because an epistle is a letter. He did not believe in Jesus while Jesus walked on the earth. But at the resurrection, he became a believer because some of you Bible scholars, hello, Christine Russell, good to have you, darling. We know that uh, his own family did not receive him and they didn't believe in him. And I've seen this in our daytime. A lot of times your family members don't believe that you have been changed. Well, in this case, James has now become a leader in the church and he's uh, been going, he's really speaking up for uh, Christ and believing in him. 
And our lesson on tonight is letting us know that, what was this that I read? It says, this week's lesson introduces us to the truth that there is purpose in the trials we face. That purpose is to take us, to make us strong in our faith. God does not leave us. He is there to help us, but we ought to stay focused and keep our faith. And it says, but this is not easy for anyone to go through long periods of trials and temptations. So we're going to see that tonight, that everybody that's human will go through a trial and will have temptations. In this week's lesson, James teaches us that teaches that good come out of the out of such difficulties times for the faithful believer now that's what James is getting ready to show us that if you are a faithful believer let's see what will happen because some of us have been faithful and we've had our trials and our temptations so let's look at our first uh, outline scriptures now as you see, we're, we're saying praying for wisdom. You know, you need to ask God for things. Hello, Catherine and Irene. Good to see you all. I miss you all Sunday. All right, let's read our scriptures. And this is coming out of the New Living Translation. This letter is from James. Look how he refers himself, a slave of God and of Lord Jesus Christ. I am writing to the 12 tribes Jewish believers scattered abroad. He said, Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble of any time come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with a divided loyalty is an, is an unsettled as the waves of the sea that have been blown and tossed by the wind. And then verse 7, it says, Such person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unable to do anything they do. Now, as we can see, there had been some trouble in these different, uh, in our churches back then. There was trouble, and we always know people will, when trials come up, they want to fall down and don't want to do it. But as we see, uh, James is telling them, endure, patience will pay off. And when he's talking about this, I like the way he greets them when he opens up and when he says, this letter is from James. I think the, the King James says, he says, James, a servant of, the, of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. He's letting them know greetings. He didn't say like a lot of us would be uh, uh, like to brag and boast. Boast. Well, I, I'm I'm Deborah, and I'm 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 the I am the daughter of, of Virginia, and I'm and I'm this the daughter of Maggie. And I, see, I want to boast of who I am. James didn't come across and says, "Hey, I'm Jesus's brother." Okay, you need to listen to me. No, he didn't do that. And we need to be very careful. Who we represent? Are we representing Christ? Are we representing ourselves? Or are we riding on the, curt the coattails of somebody else who we think is more important? So that's why he's greeting them like that. Because see, they had been scattered. They said the, tri uh, the 12 tribes. Now this is not the Old Testament. This is in the New Testament. And James was, he's letting them know greetings. I am a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The King James said that he was a servant, but in ours he said he was a slave. That means he was convinced and he was working to, to carry out God's plan that everyone would be saved. 
James was writing to the Jewish churches. Some people think it was just the Gentiles. No, he was writing to the believers in the whole Roman Empire. This is what he was, uh, he didn't go and set for a certain set of believers. No, he's writing this to all throughout the whole Roman Empire. He wanted everybody to get this understanding about blessings amid trials. And as we see like verse 2 when he was talking about, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble of any time come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. And then the uh, King James says, My brothers, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptation. Now, you know, it makes you double think, uh, Renee, that, okay, when I, he's saying, uh, count it all joy, I, I fell into temptation. Now, that didn't mean they fell in and stayed in it, because uh, we're going to see that everyone is tempted at some point in time, but how you handle that temptation is what's important, and that we, hello, Rosalind, we must remember that he's telling them that, he says, because, look, when he's talking about that, the brothers and sisters, when they fall into trouble and it comes your way, consider it an opportunity, he says, of great joy. You know why he's saying that? When you have faith in God, no matter what comes your way, whether it's this temptation or, or, or trials, we know that on the other side of it, we have joy in the midst of it because we know God will be there to see us through. And he says, like when he's talking about that, he says, for you know, when your faith is tested, your endurance, that's what he's saying, will grow. It's a chance for you to get better and be able to with, and hold on. Now, verse 2, he says, when trouble of any kind comes our way, like I said, we are to count it as joy. Why? Some people would think we foolish. You, you, you're struggling. You're sick. You can't pay your bills, you done went to jail, you don't, you, you're on a sick bed, and you still have joy? Yes, I still have joy because my trials are building, making my faith stronger because I still believe no matter what, I don't care what come, I still believe God will see you and he'll see me through this. And that's what James is trying to encourage them and let them know. He says because, look, he's telling them about the value of steadfastness. That means it's a value in you staying positive through your trials and your uh, uh, your temptations or your errors. You gonna it's, it's it's no sense in me sitting here telling you, oh come on over on Jesus side. You won't be tempted and you won't have no trials. No, you are human just like I'm human. When Christ walked this earth, he was in the form of a human body and he was even tempted and he had trials. But he did not forget why he came here. Uh, anybody out there with me? So that I'll know. And like he says in verse 3 when he says, For you know is endurance. And then that's your endurance. It improves your faith. Faith is what we have. And faith is what we hold on to no matter what. And then in verse 4 he says, So let it grow. For when your endurance are fully developed, not not partially, this is an ongoing process. You will be perfect and complete and need nothing. Now that's what he's saying. He says, let patience, let it be, be perfect. In other words, be still and know, wait and see the outcome. He says, because you'll, he says, complete work and you will do nothing. You shouldn't do nothing that will limit that. Have patience. You just getting in a hurry. We live in a in a fast food, hurry up time. We 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 don't even take time to cook a meal. We rather go get the chicken off the corner. And the other day, I must tell y'all, I, I was questioning the guy in the line through. I got three chicken strips, and he said ten dollars. I said ten dollars. I said wait a minute, ten dollars. But guess what? We have no patience. I had chicken in the freezer. I should have cooked it, but that's what we get. We in a hurry, and then. As we see, we move on down where it says about that. I, this is one thing. It says, number five, if you need wisdom, stop just begging for money because you need wisdom. It says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you from asking. 
Wisdom is, is, is knowledge and understanding and patience. Lord, give me wisdom so that I can, I can learn and I can see. Do you know after all these years of living, I can say that I have wisdom. I've learned from my mistakes and my trials. And wisdom helped me to keep me from making those same mistakes again. And that's what he's telling them. And in verse 6 where he says, And when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Don't ask for wisdom and then turn around and think you start thinking about what Satan telling you not to do. No, your wisdom, when you ask for faith, your faith should be in God and God alone, not nobody else. Do not waver for a person with a divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave of the sea that has been blown and tossed. Now, when I read that, that's, that's verse uh, 6. When I, I thought about that, uh, uh, Deborah Price, like the uh, you're double-minded, you're moving back and forth, and you, you don't know. It's like uh, you ask, it says, but the King James says, but, if, but let him ask without wavering. When you ask something of God and you have faith, don't go back and forth. Don't say, well, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, well, you know, and then, it, then when God don't answer you when you want it, you like he said like that about, be sure that your faith is in God. Don't be unsettled. Don't be like the, the waves of the sea when the wind blow it. You know, it pushes it in and pushes it out, pushes it in. And either you in or you out. Which one are you? Are you like that? Are you uh, 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 half-stepping on God? Are you... Are you wholeheartedly dependent on God? No matter what comes up, don't be enticed by, by Satan to think, well, God not going to answer me. I might as well move on over here. No, don't do that. Have faith in God and have faith in God alone. It says, because he wants us to ask. He, he will not turn, give you an answer. Now, he may not give it when you want it, but he will be there. And then look at verse 7. He says, such people should not expect anything from God, from the Lord. When you waver and you're going back and forth, you don't expect God to do anything from you. You don't even expect something. So you're just, you, you, you're making a, a mockery out of our Lord and Savior. You should know and be strong enough. He says, listen, their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. That's verse 8. Look look what the King James says. It says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Don't you know that when you are double-minded, that there are two minds living in that body of yours? You can't function as a whole human being with two, two mind thoughts going through your head. One over here say, follow the right. One over here say, follow the left. You're going back and forth. Which are you going to be? Don't be double-minded because a double-minded man is unstable in everything. Have you ever met people? They tell you one thing and they, they, they do something different. And you're thinking, wait a minute. That ain't, they, I thought he said so and so and so and they was going to do this. And then all of a sudden, he doing something altogether different. That's a double-minded man. In other words, my mom used to say he talks out of both sides of his mouth. He tell you over here, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And over here you see him doing totally opposite of what he said he was going to do. And a double-minded man is unstable. He is not standing firmly in his faith and what he believes. He's being a showboat. He's only pretending so that he can get what he wants. And then he's going to flip again. So we need to be very careful of those that we follow, and especially those as the uh, King James says, a double-minded man, or oh, like my mom used to say, talk out of both sides of their mouth. Those are dangerous people, and we should be very careful of that. Now, I'm trying to watch my time, and we're going to, let's look at our next outline. And this is persevering in trials, and this is what we, we have. Um, verse 12, God blesses those who patiently endures testing and temptation. Afterwards, they will receive a crown of life, glory, that God has promised to those who love him. 
verse 13. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone. Verse 14, temptation comes from our own desires, and it says, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to two sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Now, when I read that, I got totally excited because I thought about that and, and it, it takes me some time before I can get a full understanding of things. Hello, uh, Michelle Kane. Good to have you, darling. And you think about it and it said, God blesses those who patiently endure. Yes, it's hard to endure. Yes, you get impatient, but you must patiently endure your testing, your sickness, your, your loss of a job. Be patient. Wait on God. He, 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 that's just a test. And you, and when you're tempted, that's a test. Don't give in. He says, afterwards, they will receive a crown of life. When I saw that, that God has promised to those who love him. When I saw that, I got excited about the crown of life. I said, oh, 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 we're going to get a crown of life. But doing my research, let me read something that I, I thought was very touching that not only do we get a crown of life, there are five crowns mentioned in the Bible. The first one is the crown of rejoicing. Why? Why are we rejoicing when we see the word of God going forth in somebody else? That's the crown of rejoicing. We should get excited when we share the word with someone and they, they get excited and they want to learn more. The second is the crown of righteousness. Do y'all see that? And it says, which is given to those who live a clean life while looking for and loving the Lord's return, a crown of righteousness. Then we have a crown of glory, the crown of glory, which is given to those who faithfully feed the flock of God through teaching, preaching God's word. Do you see that? And that don't just reply to preachers in a pulpit. We as individual laborers and followers, we can receive that same crown of glory when we share the word with someone else. Number four, the incorruptible crown. Y'all, these crowns make me feel good already. He says, incorruptible crown, which is given to those who run a good race in this Christian life. How many of us want that incorruptible crown? And then that last one, which our text talks about, is the crown of life. It's given to those who suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. Isn't that something, Rosalind? The crown, oh, we got, there are five crowns mentioned in the Bible, five crowns. It, it, I got excited about that because when I just saw that crown of life, I was like, oh yeah, we all gonna get a crown of life. Uh, there, there are four more, all together there are five. Five crowns, can you imagine how, how we are look in the presence of God when he's crowned us with these five different crowns that we can enjoy right here on this earth. Do y'all hear me? I don't care how many tiaras, Miss Universe, Miss Texas, Miss TSU, Miss U of H, uh, Miss uh, Texas, uh, Rosin, but that crown of life and the crown of righteousness, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of glory. I, I'm, I'm ready to cut the lesson off already because this those crowns make me want to stay in this race and stay there. He says, and remember, you are being tempted. Do not say God tempts us. God does not tempt us. And to let it be known, Satan don't tempt you either. He put it there. It's up to you whether you accept the temptation or not. God does not tempt you. You know, when Christ was on, in the mountain and the devil came to him and told him, he showed him all this and you can have it. He was, he was putting that temptation out there before our Lord and Savior. But our Lord and Savior would not take that temptation. And that's what we have to do. He says, and then don't go and say, God is tempting me. When something goes wrong and you're struggling, Irene, don't say the Lord tempting you. Mm -mm. My God does not do that. God does not. God is too holy. He don't have time for that. That's foolishness. Temptation is before everybody. If Christ was tempted, 
What about you and I? Anybody out there can see this like I do. And then he says, God never tempted to do wrong. God is holy. Wrong in sin. God has nothing that separates everybody from God. And that's what he says. He says, and he never, God, y'all hear me? You, you hear me, Sister Ridgeway? God never tempts no one. Temptation is, is, is sinful. It's just there. It's there. It's up to you. But don't blame God when you fall into temptations. Don't, don't blame God. That's your choice. You can't even blame Satan because it's up to you. You are an individual person that think, and God has given you that being of making choices for yourself. And then he said, temptation comes from our own desires. You, you, anybody out there, Rosalind? Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away from God. That, I don't care how much beer they line up in front of me. But I can easily say, well, because I, I, I don't like beer. Okay, but if they line up tea, or Kool-Aid, or Coca-Cola, or scotch and water, whatever your thirst is, it's up to you whether you accept that and drink that or not. No, don't say, well, I'm, I've never been tempted. Yes, you have. And then it said, entice and drag us away. Now, the word entice used to mean what they did when they went fishing. They put the bait on the hook. The hook was to entice the fish to come and get it. So this is what it says, entice us and then drag us away. Some of us don't get uh, drug away. We just walk away. We, we, we don't know. And I hope that I, I'm talking to someone other than myself. He says, and then those desire to give birth to sinful actions. Do y'all see that? Sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, you see that? In other words, when you keep doing wrong, you're going to give birth to death eventually. It's like a woman conceives a child in the womb and nurtures and free. that child comes forth and he lives a life in some time a day that child will die. This is what he's trying to give us about our desires and simple actions. Because look, once we, when we sin, we allow it to grow and grow and fester and grow and grow. And then after it grow, we, it has given birth to death. And this is what uh, James is telling them to be careful of with their understanding and what they're doing. So as we can see, what time is it? Okay, let, let's get to our next outline. And uh, I was just so excited about those crowns, you all, till I, I almost wanted to cut it off. So let's look at our next outline. And this is the last one. Perfect gifts from above. This is, this is so touching to me, and I hope that someone else sees this. Verse 16. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. He says, Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all lights in the heaven. He never changes or casts a sh shifting shadow. He says, He chose to give birth to us by giving us His true word. And we, out of all creations, become his prized possessions. Do I need to say anything else? He, it, it says, don't be misled, dear brothers and sisters. See, he, he, he included men and women. He says, whatever good and perfect gift coming down to us from God our Father who created all the lights, you see how James is letting them know that good and perfect gift. Uh, uh, Brother Randall, you, you, you dress sharp every Sunday. You own it, boy. I tell you, you dress sharp. But those kind of gifts are only material. The good and perfect gifts that we get from God, it comes from Him. Man does not have his hands on those perfect gifts. When we become new believers and we have a better understanding of God's word, that's a gift for you all. And that gift comes from God himself. And he said, because guess what? He created the lights and everything. But guess what? He never 
cast. He never changes a cast, a shifting shadow. God still blesses us with perfect gifts. Isn't that wonderful? Just, I don't care how many gifts I receive from my family or whatever. There's a perfect gift that we have been given from God. And you know, our, our icing on the cake, the perfect gift is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the perfect gift that we have been given. And he says, look, he chooses to give birth to us. You see that? Those of us that were birthed out of sin and shaped in iniquity, God gives birth to us by giving us his true word. So there's no reason for us to go astray and listening to everything else that we know is not of God. And he's telling us that that right there that is given to us the true word of god and we out of all the creations are his prized possession out of the whole earth the fowls of the air the fish in the sea everything else do you know that we as human beings are his prized possessions that has make that makes me want to say hallelujah thank you jesus who who, who am i a wretch undone, and God still sees me as a prize, as his possession. He's so proud that he made me, and he loves me regardless of my sinful ways. And I know I got to stop because I'm going over, but I want to read you this conclusion. And, and I, don't forget those crowns, y'all. It says, as Christians, we must not let afflictions and trials cause us to become unsteady and shaken. The person who is driven and tossed about by the wind, not exercising unwavering faith, will not receive anything from the Lord. That kind of unstableness indicates a double-minded man who is unstable in all his ways. But with wisdom from God, glory, hallelujah, we can endure even the most difficult times, trials, temptations, afflictions, and more a part of life here on earth. In the midst of all the, these shines the promise of God. That's uh, near my road. Here we go, Marie. Listen at this. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. Do y'all, do you hear me? And the psalmist says, Weeping may endure for a night, but all joy cometh in the morning. Our faith must be put to practice. Blessings amid trials. I pray and I hope that something was said and, and you can rejoice like me. And I want to say thank you for all of those who joined in and carry this and share this. Make sure someone else see our lesson so that they might enjoy it as well. Amen. Good night to all of you all. I love you. Thank you for your prayers and continue to pray for pastor. And I'll see you on the next occasion.